Er is niks niets onder die sonnie, maar die skouspel waarop ons nou wacht, sal sterflinge op aarde en wie weet waar nog, dat ek eers weer oor een duisend jaar kan sien. Oboot Shoemaker Liby maak kennis met Opa Jupiter. Ons saai die drama volgende uit van Sutherland af. Ons pas die rest van ons program tye daarby aan vir die volgende. Weegskal, Blankmeier en Jensen, Aardhoeks gedachte vir die dag, en dan terug na die sterreruim en satellite vir Sky News. Welcome to the South African Astronomical Observatory at Sutherland in the Cape. We're in one of six domes, and this dome houses the 30-inch telescope, which does some amazing work deciphering emissions from Jupiter when it's struck by fragments of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Marinas. Goedenavond vanuit de ijskoude Sutherland, en dit is ons voorrecht om u te laten deel uit die dramatische gebeuren vanuit die ruimte. Nou, this telescope is very suitable for this specific job as it is fitted amongst others with a infrared camera. The infrared camera analyzes the heat radiations coming from the impact site on Jupiter. Furthermore, on site we have an expert team of local and overseas astronomers who will analyze the data received. This is Sutherland in the southwest part of South Africa, known as the Rockefeller. A high altitude, dry, and at this time of the year, intensely cold region, with cloudless night skies ideal for star watching. The weather condition here is so good, and the sky condition as well. And we've been having such a good weather, we haven't lost any time at all. Like Sutherland really is an excellent site. This, worldwide, there's only a small number of really excellent astronomical sites. You have to be away from centers of population, as I've mentioned, you have to be on a fairly high site, you want a large percentage of clear skies, and uh, Sutherland satisfies essentially all of these, and it's really is one of the best sites in the, in the world. Sutherland's largest telescope is the 1,9 meter Radcliffe. Manufactured in Britain just before the Second World War, it was installed at Pretoria after the war, but the growth of that city and the consequent disturbance caused to astronomical observation necessitated a move. Sutherland was the ideal site, and the Radcliffe was set up there in 1976. Although the 30-inch telescope, as it is still referred to, is not the largest telescope on site, nor is it the largest telescope in the world, obviously, nor is it the highest, it is the best type of instrument for this job. After all, Jupiter is not that far away, and we have to collect certain radiations from Jupiter for which we need dark skies and crisp, cool air. And for that, Sutherland, of course, is ideal. Sutherland being one of the darkest places on the world. Fitted to the telescope is an infrared camera. The infrared camera, this brassy type of instrument, is kept at a temperature of minus 211 degrees Celsius. It is ideal for capturing the heat or the infrared radiations because that is what these explosions stir up from Jupiter, from here it is fed into electronic devices from here the signals are fed into a computer where they are processed into a visual format which is suitable for the astronomers on site to analyze the information and for us to present you with accurate pictures. The image scale that we get on this telescope matches very much better to this camera than it would on the 1.9 meter telescope. I think it's really caught the uh, imagination of people, public, worldwide. I mean, this is the first time that we've predicted in advance of the crash of a comet into a planet. We are pretty certain that these crashes have happened in the past, but never have they been predicted in advance. And the idea of sort of um, megatons 
millions of megatons of explosion happening. I mean, for example, the fragment that's going to um, impact tonight, the biggest fragment, is the size of Table Mountain, and that's going to be hit, hit Jupiter. On last night's news, you saw a number of images of Jupiter, and the small, sharp ones were taken by this 11-inch reflector telescope here at Sutherland, to which, or onto which, is fitted the SABC's broadcast quality camera. Here we are live at Sutherland in our reconditioned studio. Before we talk to those studio guests, let's take a brief look at the images we're receiving right now from that 11-inch reflector telescope. And there it is. There you see Jupiter. And the most sophisticated infrared camera in the world is attached to the 30-inch telescope and, of course, processed by computer. Right now, there it is, as we anticipate the largest impacts of Shoemaker-Levy 9, we see this image from that infrared camera. Now, um, uh, John, at this stage, I yeah. think we should mention that the red one on the left, that is actually an image of the raw data coming in. Oh, yeah. So what they do is they take this raw data and subtract everything they've pre-recorded what is coming in from other sites from that, and that produces the right-hand picture. And the right-hand picture is therefore as pure from Jupiter, infrared-wise, as one can say. All the irrelevant data has not necessarily been subtracted from that. Yeah, and the astronomers tell us that we are seeing a processed image. That's it. I mean, yeah, what, 30 correct. seconds after the impact is recorded. So it's the real McCoy, isn't it? Well, visual or optical telescopes are rarely used these days, but the country's second largest reflector telescope, that's a 60-inch instrument, is situated at Boyden Observatory near Bloemfontein, and this telescope is also linked to our transmission tonight. And this is what we're seeing there. A word or two from uh, Dr. Whitelock, perhaps. What do you think? Well, I think we can see quite a, a good... Uh, yeah, well, it's off the screen now, but we were seeing what? We were seeing the, the impacts, two of the previous impacts. Yes, and we see it again uh, there. And we can see it again there, yes. Yeah. In, in the center, you have one, and disappearing around the top. We're looking at the top of the image. Um, right. but the impacts are the, the black patches. Right. Why, why, why black, Dr. Whitelock? Uh, it's, it's to do with the fact that they're not reflecting very much light in the optical. So what we're seeing here is actually an image of Jupiter in terms of reflected light. Yes. And those dark patches are like burnt felt, not reflecting the light that good. Is that correct? That, that's a fair enough summary. Yes, the planets all shine by reflected light. They, we see them only by the light of the sun coming back to us. Right, thanks very much. Well, without further ado, you've just been uh, listening to and seeing uh, Dr. Patricia Whitelock astronomer of course and with us do I need to introduce him Marinus Weinbeck our science correspondent and uh, Dr. Robert Stobie director of this famous uh, astronomical observatory Dr. Stobie let's ask what I think the, the people want to ask first what are we looking forward to in what three quarters of an hour's time well there are two impacts tonight um, the predicted times of these impacts are, in terms of local time, uh, 32 minutes past nine. And the second one, which is the biggest fragment of all 21 fragments, is at uh, one minute to ten. Now, these are estimated times of impact. In practice, we found that all the other fragments that have impacted have actually impacted some minutes after the uh, expected time, between five and, say, 20 minutes after. We don't know how accurate these are going to be, but it could be within that time slot, so. How do you estimate even that appropriate time? They have done very accurate measurements of the um, comet and its fragment over, since um, March 1993, when it was first discovered. And they've tracked the position of these um, comets in space of the, of the fragments yes. of the comet in space, and this leads them to very accurate orbits, and they know for certain that it's orbiting Jupiter and uh, is going to crash, and they've been able to predict these crash times within about an uncertainty of 10 minutes. Are they sort of checking on the regular speed of it? Well, they've been, um, they have to do calculations that take account of all the effects of the gravitational force in Jupiter oh, yes. and all that, yeah. and the um, acceleration that the uh, fragments are subject to. And the difficulty has been in the very recent images uh, that when it gets, because they're now so close to Jupiter, the light of Jupiter makes it very difficult to make them out. And so they've had to rely on uh, predictions from 
some a week or so ago. Dr. Whitelock. And of course, we, we have to remember that the comet is going into the, the, the reverse side of Jupiter. So we don't see the impact on the instant it happens. We have to wait for the material to be shot out into space and appear yes. around the limb. Yes. Well, yes, um, you were telling me a couple of days ago about the, the distance, the time distance. I mean, obviously, it's happened, and then we see it later, right? Well, you see, the, the interesting part is what we're going to look at later tonight has already happened. Yes. What we are actually waiting for is all those light waves, all those heat waves, with the information to reach us, am I right? Mm. This is correct. We know that the time of travel for the light waves from Jupiter to Earth is about 45 minutes. Mm. So, uh, Just to walk down the road in astronomical terms, somebody said, right? Yes. Uh, but of course uh, we also know that nothing travels faster than light, so to all intents and purposes there's no way we're going to get any kind of information. And there's until no, there's the no light way we're going to get out of this next piece of information, because I have to tell you, Big announcement, it's time for an ad break. <laughs>